Okay. <clears throat> I think I'm all wired up, ready to go. Do appreciate everyone being out. I have an opportunity to to present God's word, and, and I pray that I do so respectfully. If there's anything you disagree with, please let me know. I'd be more than glad to study along with you. <clears throat> God has riched us, has richly blessed us in this life. He has given us dominion to use or to misuse any and all of those blessings. He allows us to decide for ourselves what choices we want to make. And unfortunately, we don't always make the right decisions. We don't always make the right choices. Our lesson this evening is really about choices and making, hopefully, the right choices. But to illustrate the point that the Lord has given us choice. We're going to look at a number of different areas uh, uh, by which we can just examine. I'm sure there's far more than what I'm even presenting as far as the kind of choices that we are actually making on a daily basis. We're going to start with wealth. <clears throat> Ananias and Sapphira, really a couple of individuals, Christians, if you will, that really aren't unlike us. They had some wealth. Yet they weren't called on the carpet for what they had, but how they used what they had. Before the land was sold and even after the land was sold, the Apostle Peter reminds them that they had a choice given from God to use the land and the money in whatever manner they desired. It wasn't like they had to do what they did. They could have chosen to do something that was correct but rather they chose to do something that was wrong. Let's go to reread verse 4 of Acts chapter 5. Peter asks them, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? He's saying, you've got a choice. The Lord didn't do anything here. It was totally up to you. You could have kept the land. You could have sold the land. You could. Have, but what they did is they sold it and then presented it to the apostles as though the half price that they actually acquired was the full price. And really, <clears throat> Peter calls them on it. So why are you lying? <laughs> it, there's no reason to, to lie. Why, why did you choose to do that? You see, they had a choice to make, apparently. They tempted in some manner, greed, wealth as it is. As it is, a lot of people want it and want more of it. And so, I guess, they decided in their hearts that they were going to be deceitful. Now, God has given us all the ability to choose how we want to use our money. God isn't over your back saying you have to use it this way or that way. But, folks, we can't be using it in illicitly. We can't be using our money for wrong purposes or wrong reasons. I could decide how much to spend on my bills. I can. And... How much to share with others, and how much I want to give back to the Lord. You see, those are choices that I make every week. It's our choice to give a little back to the Lord or a lot. Going over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, <clears throat> let's read verses 6 and 7 of 2 Corinthians 9, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now understand, he's talking about money here. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now notice who gets the choice as to how much to give or whether or not to even give. He says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. In other words, that's your choice. The Lord's given you a choice. You can decide if you want to give a lot or give a little. He's just asking. He says, well, don't give a feeling like you have to give of necessity. And, and don't give grudgingly as though I have to give. He doesn't want your money if that's the case. But he says, as far as the amount, as you purpose. Well, you get to decide what you purpose. The Lord isn't deciding that for you. That's a choice that we all get to make. And just understand the principle that preceded it. If you give 
Uh, what's the word sparingly? Well, then you're going to reap sparingly. But if you give bountifully, you will also reap bountifully. A lot of people just need to understand the principles that the Lord establishes, and they would probably do a lot better in life. But sometimes we don't trust or have the faith that is necessary to give bountifully, as we should, because we're so scared of losing what little we have. Think about it, because what the Lord says is true. Now, Paul encourages everyone not to covet money, but to do and to be, uh, to be generous. <clears throat> We're going to go to a very familiar passage out of 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to read verses 9 and 10. It says, But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many people make their life miserable by the way the choices that they make concerning their money. <clears throat> and it doesn't tell us in this verse what those choices are. He's just telling you right up front that you get the choice to make and a lot of people make bad choices in, in regards to money. And they pierce themselves through with many sorrows because they make bad choices concerning money. But nonetheless, the Lord gives you that choice to do with it as you want, to use or misuse it. But understand there could be consequences. Going over to verse 17 of the same chapter, is to command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Our source is really God. And so here, Paul's encouraging Timothy that he needs to make good, wise decisions with the money or with those who have money need to be encouraged to use the money wisely. Again, he's encouraging choice, good choices, because we all have choices in life. And wealth is just one area of choice. Do you know you have the ability to choose your abilities or how you want to use, I should say, your abilities? You see, God gives us abilities. Now, I, I provide three verses uh, in your outline that outline uh, or to tell us about the abilities that the Lord does give us. I'm just going to use uh, Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 3 through 8. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one in the body and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying he's giving different members different abilities. We have different abilities. <clears throat> and he's encouraging you to use those abilities that the Lord has given, but he's encouraging you to use those abilities appropriately. If you're going to give, give cheerfully, you see, or liberally, as he says. Or if you're going to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You see, these are abilities that the Lord gives each and every one of us. Now, which abilities you have? Uh, well, I think you probably know better than I know. But whatever your abilities, the Lord gives you a choice to use them. You get to decide how you want to use those abilities, and the Lord's encouraging you to use them appropriately. How about time? Do you ever stop to think that the Lord gives you choice with time? You see, time is given to us by God. Let's go to James chapter 4, and, and we actually get to use how, or get to decide how we use our time. <clears throat> James chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Whereas, do you not know what will happen tomorrow? For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live to do this or that. But notice who gets to decide if we get to do this or that. You see, the Lord says, don't forget about me. Time is short. The Lord gives you time. 
But it's short. Don't think you got all the time in the world. You know, that would be a bad decision, you see. You need to use the time that the Lord has given you, and the Lord allows you to choose how to use your time. And he says, just don't forget by who controls the time. So how do we use it? Do we use it in our Bible studies? Do we use our time that we have to study God's Word? Or do we use our time to teach others? Or do we use our time to worship God? Now, here, I think we do very well as compared to other places that I've been. But are we? And you are the person who knows more than anybody else knows if you're studying or taking the time to do these things. We do very well in our worship. But yeah, I see that. But how do we do in our study? How do we do in our teaching? How do we do in other facets of the time in which the Lord gives us? Do we spend our time helping, encouraging other individuals, whether it be family or members of the church? How, how do we use that time? The Lord gets, lets you decide. Pray that you use it wisely. You say, we don't want to waste it. It's our choice. How about our bodies? You know that the Lord gives us bodies to use, and we get to decide how we want to use those bodies. Now, again, the Lord's encouraging us not to use our bodies wrong, because, again, with choice, we could do it right or we could do it wrong. And, of course, the Scriptures always are encouraging us to use what the Lord has given us properly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now understand, the body that you have, if you became a Christian, is not your body. For you were bought at a price. What price? Christ's death upon the cross. He paid that price to make you a Christian. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, you have a body, and you can use your body however you want to use your body. The Lord gives us choice, but you don't want to use it wrong. You don't want to misuse the body. God gave it to us to use. So do we glorify God in our bodies, or do we degrade Him by using our bodies for things like alcohol, and tobacco, and fornication, or adultery, or you name all the homosexuality, you just sodomy, I mean, just keep going, there's... A lot of sins involved with the body. How do we use our body? It's our choice. The Lord encourages us to use and make good choices. How about influence? <clears throat> I don't think we think too much about our influence, do we? We kind of wonder if we even have any influence in this wicked world in which we live. But going over to Romans chapter 14, <clears throat> we get to choose whether to serve the Lord or serve ourselves. Romans chapter 14 and verse 7, none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. We don't, we don't live in a bubble. <laughs> we don't. We're not living in a vacuum. We live amongst people. And we don't live for ourselves and we don't die for ourselves. Folks, we live for others. We live for the Lord. We need to make good choices. Concerning the influence in which we have. We are here to influence others. Life really, uh, despite what you might gather in the world, it's, life is not about survival. That's not really the, the, the goal. Life, in many ways, is, is about others. About helping, getting people to heaven. Who knows how to get to heaven? We do. How many people in this world, in this city, in this town know how to get to heaven. Well, I think if you ask, you probably, like that man on the street interview, and you ask him, how, I'm sure you'll get a wrong answer every time. Why? Because people don't know. They think they know, and so they'll tell you what they know, but what they know is not correct. So we need to work on using our influence. Now, conversely, we can choose to be influenced adversely by others, and a lot of people do that. Remember, evil companions corrupt good morals, according to 1 Corinthians 15.33. And a lot of people allow that, allow the corruption, allow the, the wrong information to go in and, and then end up losing their souls as a regard. Again, it's our choice how we want to use our influence. In fact, God gives us this choice to become his children. You know that? He allows us to decide if we want to become a Christian. 
Now, I'm not going to talk about how to become a Christian per se. But let's go over to John chapter 1 and read verses 12 through 13. But as many as receive him, to to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Now he's talking about a certain group of people. People who believe in him. He says he's given them the right or the authority to become his children. Who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. They were born through that watery grave of baptism that is expressed throughout scriptures. The point being, though, is that we have a choice, or we have the power, we have the right to decide if we want to become Christians. I often wonder if we even consider what decisions we make in regards to becoming a Christian, because I think a lot of Christians, as we talked before, don't realize the cost of becoming a Christian. But that perhaps is a different issue at a different time. We have that ability to choose if we want to become a Christian. Now, it's not given to us by some bloodline, like it was in the Old Old Testament, Jewish. It's not given us to, to us as some kind of birthright. You're the first person born in the family, so therefore you get it. No, that's not how it works. It's not given to us by man's devices, man's rules. In other words, uh, whatever some denomination says you have to do in order to uh, become a member of the church. And, and if you follow their prescribed methods or whatever they do, that, and that's, not, that's not how it works either. It says, but of God. It says, his way. That's the only way that you can become a Christian, is to do it scripturally. New Testament scripture, which is immersion. Now, that's just the point on which you are saved. But you still have to repent. You still have to confess Christ as your Savior. You're still going to have to live your life even after you believe in here. You're going to have to live your life in obedience to him all the remaining days of your life. And you get to make that choice. He's telling us right here, you you have that right. You have that authority. You have that power to become a Christian. It's your choice. However, it doesn't mean I'll make the right choice. A lot of people are told what is necessary for salvation and they just turn it down flat. And we get upset. But folks, it's their choice. If they want to turn it down flat, that's their choice. The Lord gave that to us. God has given us the privilege to make the choice. And of course, we would encourage everybody to make the choice. The correct choice, to become a Christian. Even as difficult as it gets, we would rather everybody be on that narrow path than to take the wide one that leads to destruction. We certainly would encourage everyone to do what's right. But I also mentioned that once you become a Christian, you know, you have the choice to remain faithful. In other words, you, it's not a lock just because you became a Christian, just because you were immersed. In fact, let's go over to Ro- Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. It tells us here, Do not fear any of those things which are about to suffer. Now he's talking to the church at Smyrna. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will be, have tribulation ten days. Be, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, why does he say fa- be faithful unto death? Because he knows they got a choice. <laughs> when, the, when the trials come, and in particular, he's talking about martyrdom here, when, when you're being told to denounce Christ or die, you got a choice to make. He says, be faithful unto death, and you'll receive that crown. But you have a choice. Even after you became a Christian, your choice as to whether or not you want to continue to be faithful or not. Is your physical life more important to you than your spiritual life? That's your choice. You get to decide that. Nobody's going to take that from you. You're the one who decides that. And so when you stand before God, understand you're just going to have to account for what the choices you made. But that's another choice that we get to make. Whether or not we want to remain faithful. The early church had a rough time with physical persecution. But here John encourages them to be faithful because he knows that many will choose not to be faithful. And folks, more people, more Christians in the first centuries chose not to be faithful than did choose to die. 
more died, or excuse me, more did not die. And the emperor said, denounce Christ or die, more chose not to be Christian. But that's your choice. People, folks, will give up their faith for far less than physical, physical persecution, far less than their life. People will give up their faith for a drink of alcohol. People will give up their faith for a good-looking woman or a number of other things. Folks, that's the reality. So whatever the temptation is, understand that's your choice. The Lord is giving it to you. He encourages you to make the right choice. And we need to encourage one another to always make the right choice, but uh, it doesn't always happen that way. In fact, you know, God is willing to forgive us of our sins. But you know, whether he forgives us of our sins oftentimes is our own choice as to whether or not we want to ask him for forgiveness of our sins. Let's go to John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1, and let's read verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice the if. If is conditional. <laughs> that means if you choose to confess your sins, then yeah, the Lord will forgive you. You've got to be repentant, but you, yeah, the Lord will, and he'll cleanse you from your sins. In other words, he'll, he'll forgive you. And you won't have to be worried about it. However, it's our choice whether we wish to obey him, whether or not we wish to even ask him to forgive us. That's why that continual cleansing is so, so terrible because it gives the idea that you don't need to even ask. And here the Lord says, if you do, meaning if you don't, <laughs> you don't ask to be forgiven, you're not going to be forgiven. Is that really hard to understand? If we repent of our sins, God will forgive us. However, we choose whether to repent and ask for his forgiveness or not. It's really left up to us. We get to choose that. And the Lord is faithful on his end. He says, I'll forgive you every time. <laughs> you repent and you ask for forgiveness. It's, it's a done deal. Really, the, the burden becomes ours as to whether or not we want to repent and whether or not we want to ask for forgiveness. So what we kind of covered here this evening, we all have the privilege to make choices. The privilege to make choices was given to us by God. In fact, we just covered a, a number of different facets, about eight of them, areas that we make choices probably on a daily basis. But folks, we make far more choices than that every single day. And God gives us that privilege to make choices. Now, God is watching to see what choices we make, and he will be our judge on that final day. So if we make bad choices and we don't get them corrected, we could face eternal consequences for that. We need to, to pay attention to our conduct. We need to pay attention to everything, every facet of life, and make correction as we become aware, because we don't want to be flat-footed on the judgment day. Do we want to hear the Lord ask us on that final day, well, was it not your own? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a shame to hear that? Well, wasn't it your choice? Wasn't it your own? Didn't, didn't you have that ability to decide to do what was right, but you chose to do what's wrong? Wasn't it, your, wasn't it your decision to be evil? You see, we can't say, well, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't. No, it, you, you knew. You had a choice to make. And unfortunately, more people are going to choose the wrong choice than the correct one. But would you rather hear the Lord say, was it not your own? Or would you rather hear, well done, good and faithful servant? That choice is yours as well. If you're subject to that decision, please come. As we stand and sing, the invitation's on. <clears throat>